Derek Prince Ministries, proclaiming the inspired Word of God around the world. Derek Prince is an internationally recognized Bible teacher and author. Through books, audios, videos, and radio broadcasts, Derek seeks to reach the unreached and teach the untaught. In over 50 years of ministry, Derek has reached over 100 nations in more than 50 languages. And now, Derek Prince. God has a plan for America and for the nations of the earth, and you may be part of it. Hello, I'm Scott Ross. I'm a television host for CBN, the Christian Broadcasting Network, and the Family Channel. In December of 1994, Derek Prince was awakened out of his sleep in the night by the voice of the Lord saying to him, Do you want to know my heart for America? His response was to get out of bed, kneel by the bed, and inquire of the Lord. This message is a result of that voice. We are asking you to open your hearts and your ears and your heart what Derek is about to say to us. There are two words we don't like to hear in the Christian church, nor in the world for that matter, judgment and repentance. God will do one and requires the other. As a result of this conference, we came to that place, and we're asking you as you watch this and hear this, that you're not passive, that you get involved. It will require something of you. This is not just another message where we can go about business as usual. Derek Prince is confronting us with what I believe to be a prophetic word. You will know that a prophetic teacher has been among you. With those remarks, I invite you now to listen closely and hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches through this servant, Derek Prince. In verse 49, God lists the sins of Sodom. And it's very interesting, he doesn't mention homosexuality. But he states the social and spiritual conditions which will inevitably produce homosexuality. Listen. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness, Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. How much does that apply to contemporary America? Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness, and a failure to take care of the poor. Those conditions are what produce homosexuality. So we cannot stand back and say, well, we're not responsible. Because if we fostered and tolerated and enjoyed those conditions, we are responsible for what they've produced. Now, I am not here with a negative message. About a month ago, just about a month ago, when we were in Auckland in New Zealand, the Lord woke me up at about 2 a.m. and that's the time he tends to wake me up if he's got something to say. And this was so serious that I did something I very seldom do. I had to get out of bed, kneel by my bed, and pray. And God was dealing with me also, but he said to me, Dear Lord, he said, Are you willing to ask me, Jesus, to give you my heart for America? I said, Lord, what are you asking? I, I don't have any way to understand the depth of your grief over America. And you want me to ask for your heart for America? It came to me the word that really sums up the attitude of Jesus toward America this time is disappointment. He is disappointed. He has done for this nation more, I believe, in many ways than he's ever done for any other nation in human history, spiritually and materially. And what has been the response of the nation? I think disappointment is the mildest word you could use to express the re reaction of Jesus. And he said, Are you willing to ask me to give you my heart 
for America. I really, this was a very real interview. And I said after a while, Lord, the people of America have been so kind to me. They've honored me. They've supported me. They've brought my ministry forth. How could I ever say I won't ask you to give, him, give, you, give me your heart for America? So I'd have to say <laughs> reluctantly, I said, okay, Lord, if that's what you want, give me your heart for America. And a little while later, Ruth and I prayed together on that and we said, Lord, give us your heart for America. And I want to tell you, it's a broken heart. It's a heart that's deeply, deeply grieved. He says, if he said, what more could I have done for that nation than I have done? And see how they've responded. Now I am aware God has his precious saints in America, many of them. Some of them are here this morning. But listen, now this is God's response to the situation that he's described. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. One man. And one of the most tragic statements in the Bible was I found no one not even one man and said therefore I have poured out my indignation on them I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath and I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads notice that therefore if I could have found one man I could have spared them how is it with you can the Lord find somebody more than one person? Can the Lord say to his church, will you stand before me in the gap for this land? Will you make up a wall that I do not have to pour out the last drops of my wrath upon them? That's a question I'm asking you this morning. I've heard people say, there are so many millions of born-again Christians. Some people say 30, some say even 40 million in the United States. I say, well, if they are, where are they and what are they doing and why is the nation going downhill steadily all the time? There's only one explanation. If they really are Christians, they are salt that has lost its savor. You know what Jesus said about salt that has lost its savor? It's thenceforth good for nothing Good for nothing, that's bad language, isn't it? But to be thrown out and to be trampled underfoot by men. And I want to tell you that if the Church of the United States does not change, it will be trampled underfoot by men. And there are a lot of men pretty eager today to trample the Church underfoot, is that right? There's an extraordinary hatred of Christ and the Church today. In the, in the United States. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 31. Well, let's go back to verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. Therefore, and I always say to people, when you find a therefore in the Bible, you want to find out what it's there for. And... Uh, Scott very clearly explained what it's there for. He did a masterly job. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. I think the better translation was, will be answerable to the body and blood of the Lord. He cannot plead ignorance. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, 
eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now verse 30, for this reason many are weak and sick among you and many sleep, many have died. Many who? Many Christians. I've been in a lot of healing services, I don't think I've ever heard anybody pinpoint that as a main reason why Christians are sick. They have partaken of the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. And Paul writing, I mean if, if ever a church was charismatic it was the church at Corinth. And he said, for this reason many of you are weak and sickly. And many have died. If you are seeking healing here this morning, I think you need to check on the cause of your being sick. Now, what's the remedy? Verse 31 and 32. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the law, that we may not be condemned with the world. As I see it, there are three possibilities. First of all, the best is we judge ourselves and repent. If we don't do that, the Lord will chasten us. And a lot of sickness, including some I've experienced, is the Lord's chastening. And I thank God by His grace, I recognized it for what it was and I repented. And people graciously say to me, you look so good, better than we've seen you. Well, one reason is the Lord chastened me and I repented. That's the second possibility. The third possibility is the Lord chastens you and you don't repent. And then you are judged with the world. Those are only three possibilities. Judge yourself and repent. Let the Lord judge you and chasten you and repent. But if you don't go those first two routes, then, and you continue in your stubbornness, your disobedience, you'll be judged with the will. That's the way. Now, in closing, I want to go to Amos chapter 6. And I'm going to read the first six verses. Now, much of what Amos says does not literally apply to you. But I think if you make the necessary adjustments for time and culture and situation, a great deal of it does apply to the Christians of America today. Amos says, Woe to you who are at ease in Zion. In other words, you're claiming to be God's people. Zion is the place of God's dwelling. And trust in Mount Samaria, which at that time was still a very... Uh, noble city, a large city, adorned with many wonderful buildings. Notable persons in the chief nation, that's Israel, to whom the house of Israel comes. Go over to Calne and see, and from there go to Hamath the Great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms, or is their territory greater than your territory? I would say to the United States, look back in history. Think of all the great powerful empires that have arisen and flouted God's judgment and perished. History is littered with the ruins of empires that didn't recognize God. Is America going the same way? Verse 3, Woe to you who put far off the day of doom or judgment, who cause the seed of violence to come near. The theme of judgment is very remote. It doesn't really concern you. It's a long way away. Maybe there will be a time of judgment, but it's not right now. That's the attitude. Who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out or sprawl on your couches, eat lambs from the flock, and calves from the midst of the stall. So these people are living in luxury and feeding on the best. And if you compare America with the other nations of the world, most Americans are living in luxury. 
People don't think that way if you only compare yourself with other Americans. But as I said, I think earlier, listen, you have a bed to sleep on. A high proportion of the world's people don't ever have a bed. You have sheets on your bed and you change the sheets. You can choose what you eat and you have something to eat. Nearly one billion people don't have enough to eat. So most of us, by the world's standards, including me, we are wealthy. We're privileged. And we have to bear in mind that we're accountable for that. And then it goes on, it gets worse and worse in a way. Or more and more close to charismatics. Who chant to the sound of stringed instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David. So we have all sorts of spiritual music. We have new songs and new choruses and it's quite an industry. Is that right? It's a very wealthy industry. As an author of books, I've learned that there's much more demand for Christian music than there is for Christian books. There's a lot of money to be made in the Christian music industry. And wherever there's money to be made, there's danger. Going on, verse 6. Who drink from bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointments. Now you don't drink from bowls, I'm sure of that. But you do really live on the fat of the land. And you're pretty interested in your food. And why is it that 60% of American people today are overweight? Has that got anything to do with the way we eat? Jesus warned us against surfeiting and drunkenness. Surfeiting is overeating. He said, lest these things keep you from being ready when I return. Of course, that doesn't apply to charismatics. <laughs> we all know we're going to be ready anyhow. We're charismatics. We speak in tongues. We can quote a number of scriptures. And we attend a church. The kind that tells us what we want to hear. That's not true of many of you, but it's a picture. I think I've updated it so that you can see it's not out of date. Now then, this is the punchline, the end of verse 6. But are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Joseph is the title of the northern kingdom, which was under God's judgment and perished very shortly afterwards in a total disaster that left nothing. Even the stones of Samaria were rolled on the hill. And you can go there today and see where the stones rolled on the hill. Nothing was left. This was not far away. I think not more than 50 years away. And yet, there they were. Living it up. Having their chorus singing. Inventing new instruments. and totally unconcerned for the fate of their nation. Not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Let me ask you, if the Lord were to send out amongst the Christians of America today, the man with the inkhorn by his side. Would he mark you? Or would he pass you by? Are you really grieving, sighing and crying for the condition of your country? Or are you more or less indifferent? Well, we've got it all right. We're pretty settled. We're in a good church. I want to ask you, I feel I have authority from the Lord to ask this. I feel the Lord showed me there in Auckland what was going to happen in this meeting. I pray it may happen. I want to ask you, if Jesus said to you, would you ask me 
to give you my heart for America, how would you answer? How would you answer? If the Lord says, I'm looking for a man or a woman to stand in the gap, where would you be standing? Don't go on with the music as usual. Don't go on with the program. I'm so much in agreement with what Ross has said. Programs are for organizations, not for organ organisms. I want to challenge you. Would you this morning, after due consideration, tell God, the Lord Jesus, give me your heart for America? I'm not a born American. I have a tremendous burden on my heart for my native land of Britain. Most of you are born Americans. Would you be willing to share the Lord's burden for this nation? I believe this is critical. It's either this or total disaster. I believe disaster will come in due course, but I believe myself that God has many, many souls in this nation whom he has chosen for himself. And he's waiting with infinite patience until they've been gathered in. So would you just consider that for a moment? What is your actual attitude towards your own nation and your own people? Are you indifferent? Are you satisfied with where you are? You can't be satisfied with the way things are going in the nation. That would be impossible. So what are you going to do about it? Are you going to do anything? Or are you just going to go on with business as usual? Go to a happy meeting, clap your hands, sing the choruses, hear a sermon, and go back to living just the way you were. I want to give you an opportunity in a few moments to make a response. I have a feeling that if you want to make this kind of commitment, and please weigh it in the balance carefully before you do, I want to get you out of your seat. I think there's something very important about moving at certain points. And I want to invite you to come forward or go around any way you can and kneel. Oh, I so much agree with kneeling. There's something about kneeling. If you really want to make this commitment, don't be too respectable. Last night, I think, I forget when it was, Ruth and I were praying about this. And she did something that she very seldom does. She leaned over and put her head on my chest. And we were both trying to pray. And we couldn't get any words out. And I understood then, this is groanings that cannot be uttered. You can't say them, but they're inside you. They're painful. But don't try to utter them, because they cannot be uttered. But there's other things you can utter. So, I believe I have the mind of the Lord. Scott and Nedra, if you'd come up. Ruth, if you'd come up. John and Esther, can you come up? I believe in being surrounded by men and women of God. I don't believe this is a solo act. Now some of you may have planes to catch, I don't know. But if you have heard what I say, come up on the platform. Please. And you're moved to respond. Then think it over. And if you really want to do it, get out of your seat. Come forward somewhere, there's plenty of space and kneel. And if, you, if you're not satisfied with kneeling, prostrate yourself. Right now, let's go before the Lord. Lord Jesus, 
I don't believe that at this point we're separated by time or space. Time on a tape, television camera, or the space and distance that is between us as people. You're using this tool of television and videotape to speak to your people. Lord, I personally believe, Derek believes, and other men who have spiritual stature believe that these words we have heard is from you, that we have a choice. Lord Jesus Christ, by your grace, we choose you. I choose you. For me and my household, I choose you. Lord, as much as Noah chose to build an ark because he knew that you had spoken to him, I choose to build an ark. Lord, we pray for this nation. We pray for the nations that are watching this. We pray, Lord, for your nation, the holy nation, to come forth out of all the nations of the earth because the kingdoms of this earth will become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. You're calling forth a people. I want to be among that number. Whatever that costs me, Lord, I've counted that cost and I choose to follow you. I want to be a disciple. Today, this moment of time, I take up my cross to follow you in obedience. And Lord, I rejoice. I rejoice that you, the Lord Jesus, you, Father, you, Holy Spirit, have come to my house as you did with Zacchaeus this day. Thank you, Lord, for being merciful to your people and speaking to us. You didn't have to warn us, but you're warning us. And Lord, we take it as a warning of grace to us now. Lord, break our hearts. Allow us to rend our hearts and not our garments. And Lord, I pray you would awaken us morning by morning. As Isaiah said in chapter 50, verse 4, morning by morning as a disciple to hear your voice and hear what you're saying. And when I heard your voice, that I wouldn't turn back. Lord, in Jesus' name, right now, Lord, even now, we minister to your people. People are watching this. And people are watching this that don't know you, that they will turn from their way and come to know you as our Father, Lord Jesus, you as the Son, and you, Holy Spirit, as person of the Godhead, who is working now to even change the lives and hearts of people. Lord, grant miracles in lives right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, that the sick are healed. People are delivered from captivity, demonic power. Lord, you'll bring them out of darkness and into the light of your life and your love. We thank you, Lord, and we bless you. And may this word go forth to the ends of the earth. And may those who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. In Jesus' name, the Lord be with you.